All right. Good afternoon. Can anybody hear? Everybody hear me? People in the back, raise your hand if you can hear me fine. Great. Oh, I'll leave the door open for a bit. So, welcome to the first lecture uh, of machine learning in the series of machine learning. If that's what you uh, came for, then this is where you're supposed to be. Um, this is what we're going to do today. We'll start with some admin, where I basically explain how the course works, what is expected of you, and what you can expect of us. And then we'll dive into the material. So I'll start with the obvious question, what is machine learning? And then we'll dig into this sort of basic way of um, dividing the different methods of machine learning. So we'll start with supervised machine learning, which comes in two flavors, classification and regression. So before the break, we'll discuss what we mean by classification. And then after the break, we will, mean, we will discuss what we mean by regression. And then, if there's time, uh, oh, and then uh, unsupervised machine learning. Briefly, and then, if there's time, we'll also discuss the question of what isn't machine learning, so to speak, so you get a good idea of what is and isn't machine learning, and you get a sort of nice demarcation of what the uh, field is about, hopefully. And with a little luck, that should set you up well for the next uh, seven, uh, seven or eight weeks of learning about machine learning. Let's start with the basics so that you uh, can put that out of your head. This is your grade. Uh, it's made up of two parts, a project and an exam, each weighing 50%. Uh, to pass, you need a 5.5 on average. And also, your exam grade needs to be 5.5. And your project grade needs to be at least 4.5. Uh, the exam will cover the lectures, the literature. There's a little bit of literature. It's mostly the lectures. And everything covered in the homework, which I'll discuss soon. Uh, the homework is covered by homework sessions, which are weekly starting this week. The project grades is a group project, so you'll make groups of uh, five people. You can choose your own subject. There are some suggestions on Canvas. And there are weekly project sessions starting next week. Uh, attendance is obligatory almost nowhere. You don't have to show up for the lectures. In fact, the lectures are recorded. They will be put on YouTube. Uh, so if you have a busy life, you can just watch the lectures on YouTube if the recording goes well. Occasionally, it doesn't. Um, the only exception is that at the project sessions, one person from each group needs to be there, and they need to present, which I'll discuss in detail later. Uh, first of all, the reading. So there's some reading. Uh, there's a sort of syllabus with some basic articles which discuss, uh, which sort of go deeper into the things we discuss in the lectures. Uh, but they're mostly to support the lectures. And then there's also recommended reading, which as the title implies, is not obligatory, but it can be very helpful. So have a look at that on Canvas as well. The exam is multiple choice. 40 questions with four answers each. Uh, three types of questions. Recall, which just asks something that I've told you, uh, and all you have to do is remember it. Applied knowledge, which is something like, I ask about two things I've told you at different times, and you need to combine them to come up with the right answer. And then there's the active knowledge, which is, is the important part. One third of the exam is active knowledge, which means that we require you to calculate something, to do a derivation, to follow uh, an algorithm on some data, something like that. So this is something you need to have practiced in order to be able to answer the questions. And that practice is the homework. So all of the active knowledge questions you can expect on the exam 
you will have practiced in the homework sessions. So like I say, attendance is not obligatory, but don't complain to me if then you cannot do the active knowledge questions. There's a cheat sheet available for formulas, which you're allowed to print out and bring with you. So you don't have to memorize most of the formulas. And on this cheat sheet, there is a, uh, it's an A4 sheet. Half of the cheat sheet is blank, and in that blank uh, part, you can write, so long as you write it by hand, anything you like. So you can sort of make your own cheat sheet. And soon, practice exams will be available uh, on Canvas. If you can't wait, if you really need to see what the exam looked like now, have a look at the public <coughs> website uh, to see what last year's exams were like. This year's exams will be very similar with a few exceptions. More about the homework. Uh, the mathematics of machine learning can look a little bit intimidating if you're not used to it. It's not really that difficult. We rely mostly on three subjects, linear algebra, calculus, by which I mean taking derivatives, and probability theory. And for most of these, we don't really need more than what you would learn in the fourth, first three or four lectures. Um, nevertheless, it can look very intimidating. So if this sort of thing, these symbols look intimidating to you, make sure to read the first homework carefully, which is where we go over the preliminaries, and make sure to show up for at least the first homework session. And then you can sort of judge whether it's actually super easy or whether maybe you need a little bit of help with this. Um, one new thing this year is that we've moved from a third-year bachelor course to a second-year bachelor course. We have a very diverse set of students, but who's a second-year bachelor student? By show of hands. Uh, so not that many, actually, so it should be all right. Uh, so a word of warning to you, most of you will then have linear algebra in parallel with this course, where previously you had it, you first had linear algebra and then machine learning. We build a little bit on linear algebra, like I say, uh, I've extended the homework with some, to give you sort of the basic explanations of what linear algebra is, what a vector is, what a matrix is, that sort of thing. That should be enough to get you started. But it's difficult to coordinate these things 100%. So we might sometimes mention things that you then learn the week, a week later in linear algebra. Um, just bear with us. Uh, schedule, details, so you can sign up for a particular for a homework group and you can sign up for a project group on Canvas to know where to go. Uh, it's a bit of a messy schedule, so we didn't put it in your uh, schedule on roaster.nl. Uh, it's on Canvas, so go to this page, sign up for a group, go to this page, and then you can hopefully figure out where to go. Uh, this is also slightly still in flux. We've had some last minute changes in the TA uh, positions. So bear with us, but by the end of the week, this should be uh, fixed. And do check at the last moment whether things have changed. Oh yeah, and uh, one word of warning, if you sign up for group 13, there's no session this week, so um, you can just sit in on some other session. Just pick one, doesn't matter which one. Um, in general, that's true. If you, if by some exception for one week, you need to sit in on another group, you don't have to ask for permission, you can just do it for the homework groups. Uh, one more warning about notation. This is one of the slides from next uh, lecture already on Thursday. So if this sort of thing looks intimidating to you, again, go to the first lecture. It's easier than it looks, but um, maybe you need to brush up on the basics a little bit. The project. Uh, comes in two uh, periods. So the first part of the course, we would like you to make a project group, but explore a little bit. So do some exercises, uh, find some data set, do a bit of plotting, do a bit of playing around with it, just so you get your uh, sort of, uh, get a little practice with what you're comfortable with and what you like to do. Uh, we have some worksheets. Uh, which are uh, Jupyter notebooks, if you're familiar with that sort of thing. You can use, uh, this is based on the Python stack, which is sort of the main uh, way of doing data science. You don't have to use Python. If you try this and you don't like it, 
feel free to switch to any software or any package you like. Uh, and then on February 27th, we want you to pick a topic. If something goes wrong, you can still change, but basically we want you to broadly commit to a topic on the 27th, post that on Canvas, and then you do some experiments and you write a report, and that's your uh, deliverable, is one report delivered through Canvas by the end of the period. Uh, you will have, like I said, project meetings every week uh, with nine different projects together in one uh, project meeting. There's none this week, next week it starts. These will be informal presentations, but you will be required to have one or two slides prepared. So even though it's very informal, you do have to go up to the front of the classroom, plug in your laptop, and show some slides every week, uh, where you just report on what you've done that week. So here's some examples in case that you think, well, how are we going to report something every week? Um, in the first week, you might say, well, we're, we've looked at stuff and we're considering three different projects. You can put those on a slide, ask some questions, show that you have sort of specific questions about each product, that project that you've thought about it a little bit, and basically give the TA something to respond to. Then when the project gets started, or before you've uh, chosen your project, maybe you're playing around with some data sets, some of the example data sets that we've done, you're trying some of these worksheets. You can put that on a slide. If you have a nice plot of a data set or something interesting you've discovered, put it on the sheet, uh, put it on the slide, and maybe you have some initial problems that you're worried about, put those on the slide, slide as well. If things don't go so well, obviously, I mean, not every week is a productive week. If something goes wrong, something doesn't go well, put that on the slide. Tell us what you've done to try and fix it. Or a final example, if you're writing some big complicated code that's not going to be finished in one week, show us something that you've programmed and walk us through it, what it does, what it's for, why you think it works or why it doesn't work. So you have to be a little bit creative to come up with something every week to present, but it's not very much. You only need five or ten minutes of uh, material. If you don't present, if you don't have slides, it counts as not being present at the group meeting. Not being present once or maybe twice is not that bad, won't hurt your grade too much. But if you're not present at all, you can't pass the course or you can't get a grade for the project. Finally, a quick word on group dynamics, uh, because it's a big group, so inevitably there will be some groups that don't quite get along as well as you would hope. Um, in general, I consider this a learning goal, having a harmonious uh, working group is a learning goal, so it's your responsibility, and it's the responsibility in everybody in the group. So it's not an excuse at the end to say, well, they didn't do any work and I did all the work. That means you should have fixed that at the beginning. That's part of what you're supposed to learn. So a few tips. Don't divide up your duties and then never meet again. A harmonious group means you meet often. So meet regularly and discuss before you start the level of ambition of everybody. Because what often happens is that one or two people in the group have a very high level of ambition and they don't discuss this properly and they drag the rest along with them and the rest get, the others get demotivated and don't do work or don't understand what's going on. And that sort of leads to this kind of discord. Uh, take a little time to pick a topic, spend some time to make sure that you all on the same page, you all like the topic. Uh, don't just do this briefly, spend, a lot, spend enough time to make sure that everybody's really on board with the topic. Don't worry too much about equal workloads. I don't think there's ever been a group where the workload was distributed perfectly equally. One person is always going to end up doing more than other people. So long as everybody contributes, we're fine. Uh, Question here? Is the slide in blue uh, considered a bad thing if you do things? Ah, so the question is, is dividing duties a considered a bad thing if you do meet often? No, it's fine. Obviously, at some point, you have to divide up your duties. But the only thing is don't use it as an excuse never to meet again because that's when things go, go wrong. And I mean, these are just tips. So if you think I'm not going to listen to this, it's up to you. But uh, these are my tips for harmonious group work. 
And I would recommend for everybody to at least do all the worksheets by yourself so you have some basic level of skill throughout the group. This is the first worksheet, instructions on Canvas. Finally, you can ask me any question you like, so long as you've clicked on this button and read this page from the top to the bottom, including the frequently asked questions. After you've done that, please feel free to ask whatever you want to ask. You can also ask the TAs. They should also be able to tell you most things. So here's what to do today after the lecture. Get a work group together. Uh, there's some, uh, there's a, a thread on the discussion board where you can canvas to, um, if you have a specific thing in mind, if you want to have a very ambitious group or you don't want to have a very ambitious group, you have an inflexible schedule, this sort of thing, you want to make sure that your group members are okay with this. Uh, maybe on Canvas you can have a discussion, you can ask for a particular kind of group. In general, the rule is self-sign up, so anybody can sign up to any group that still has uh, spots left. So if you don't want some random person joining your group, make sure you get five people together and join together to a specific group. Uh, and have a look at the first worksheet and the first homework. All right. It always takes ages, but we finish the admin so we can finally get into the heart of the matter. Uh, any super urgent questions? Well, uh, if you do have anything, ask me during the break or after the lecture. So machine learning. Let's zoom out a bit and we go back to the 18th century to the work of uh, David Hume, a philosopher that you see here, or an idealized depiction of whom you see here. Um, and David Hume studied, among other things, the problem of induction. The problem of induction tells you, uh, it's basically, it's, uh, induction is a form of reasoning which Hume contrasted with deductive reasoning. So deductive reasoning is something like, come on, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. So sort of this rule-based deduction. And inductive reasoning is more fuzzy, more difficult to grasp. It's something like, I've experienced this thing, so I've experienced that the sun has risen in the east every day of my life. Therefore, I assume that it will do so again tomorrow. Now, the thing about inductive reasoning is that it doesn't always work. With deductive reasoning, we know it works and we know it always works. With inductive reasoning, sometimes you can trust your experience and sometimes you can't. To give you an example, if you go to a lot of funerals, you might say, every time I'm at a funeral, I'm never the person in the coffin. Therefore, at my next funeral that I attend, I will not be the person in the coffin. This is not correct. In fact, the longer time goes on, the more likely you are to be the person in the coffin. So sometimes it works, inductive reasoning, and sometimes it doesn't. We don't really know why. We have, this, we have an intuition for it. Obviously, one example is right. Obviously, some other example is wrong. There are some exceptions even to this rule that you can come up with. We don't really know the rules behind it. And basically, if you think about computers, this is the sort of area, this deductive reasoning, where computers do really well. You follow certain rules, we know why it works, we know it always works, you just follow the rules, follow the program, and you always come up with the right conclusion. So this is the area of computers, this is what computers actually do, is deductive reasoning in, in a way. And we want to build on top of that to make them do inductive reasoning. And Hume's intuition, I don't know if he proved it, but at, at the very least it was his intuition, is that you cannot prove inductive reasoning correct by starting from deductive reasoning. It's its own thing, they're not connected, you cannot build on one. You cannot build on deductive reasoning to create inductive reasoning. So this is sort of the general problem of machine learning. How do we make a deductive reasoning system do inductive reasoning? Uh, yeah, so this is what computers do, discrete. They are discrete, unambiguous, provable known rules. And inductive reasoning is fuzzy, ambiguous, it sometimes works, and we don't know what all the rules are. We don't know when we can apply it and what we can't. Nevertheless, we still try. Uh, so over the years, 
who's come up with a few ways of uh, teaching machines how to learn pretty well. We still don't know all the rules and when it does and doesn't work, but in some cases it does work. So here's a, a very broad definition that should capture everything you might uh, call machine learning. It's a technology that provides systems the ability to automatically learn and improve from experience without being explicitly programmed to do so. So a machine learns something and it learns that from its experience and the ultimate behavior that the machine shows has not been explicitly programmed by us. It's partly determined by whatever it experiences. So before we look at what this means in practice, let's look at where machine learning, uh, make, where it makes sense to use machine learning. Just a couple of examples to give you a sort of idea where you might apply these technologies. Um, most often probably inside other software. So a lot of you will be computer scientists, and some problems are very easy to solve in the computer, some aren't, like recognizing people. You can, uh, you don't, we don't really know how that works, we don't really know what the rules are for recognizing people. But we can say, here's a bunch of examples, this is person A, this is person B. If somebody you see look, looks like this, for whatever that means, then it's person A. Uh, and that gives you a tiny little machine learning based building block that you can integrate into a larger piece of software like a telephone, a uh, telephone operating system. If you're not building software, you might work for a company and you might be doing data mining or analytics, uh, maybe analyzing web traffic, maybe analyzing uh, the uh, things bought in shops, for instance. Uh, Machine learning can be very helpful there because it's basically making sense of data. So even though you're not building software, you're still uh, doing analytics. Machine learning can be helpful there. And finally, in science and statistics, machine learning is a kind of uh, extra powerful form of statistics. There's a big overlap there. Uh, and one way you can do this is, for instance, if any model, whatever the model can predict A from B, there must be some relation between A and B. So that gives you a scientific way of using machine learning. So lots of places to use it. Uh, sometimes it's a good idea to use machine learning, sometimes it isn't. So here are some examples. Basically what you're looking for with machine learning is a place where it's not too bad or you can deal with the situation where your machine learning system doesn't quite work. So it has to be allowed to make a mistake, which is not often true for other uh, computer, so computer science components, computer software components. But in our case, in some cases, uh, for instance, if you're recommending people a movie, usually people are happy to scroll through 10 recommendations before they pick a movie, so it's fine if one of them is wrong. It's a recommendation. It's not a, a promise that the movie is fine. So for recommending a movie, you can do use machine learning. Also because if you get it wrong, it doesn't cost so much, too much. The, the, it's, it's, it's manageable, basically. Other things like computing taxes, it's not a good case for machine learning. Firstly, because it's very bad if you make a mistake. Secondly, because we know how to do it exactly. We know what the rules are, so we can just program it explicitly. So there's no point in using machine learning. Clinical decisions, Maybe we don't know the rules, but it's very, very bad if you make a mistake. Uh, parole decisions, again, you don't want to get these things wrong and you, want to, uh, you don't want to build a system where you can't fully reason through the consequences of what its actions are. So you have to be very careful with these kinds of things if you apply any kind of machine learning there. Unlocking your phone, so these last two uh, specifically parole decisions and unlocking your phone. I added in there because people are actually using machine learning for this, even though it's not really a good idea. So we're sort of living in a world, when I started learning about machine learning, there weren't that many production systems that actually used machine learning. And these kind of lectures were kind of, um, uh, yeah, talking about what kind of systems we might one day be able to build. These days there are a lot of systems in production and we're not quite sure even what all the social consequences of them are. Uh, and some of them are in production when they shouldn't be. 
So hopefully we'll sort of touch on that as the lecture series progresses as well. Nevertheless, in some cases, machine learning is a good, good idea. Uh, so the main reason I gave in this slide is approximate solutions need to be fine because we need to be allowed to make a mistake occasionally. But also, we don't have an explicit solution. You only use machine learning if you don't have an explicit solution. If you have an explicit solution, if you know the rules, like computing taxes, you just program it out. There's no reason to use machine learning. So why wouldn't you have an explicit solution? There's different reasons. Sometimes you do have them, but they're expensive, like planning program uh, uh, problems, scheduling problems. We do know the best solution, but we don't know how to compute it effectively. Sometimes it depends on the circumstances, and we don't know by what relation. We don't know the rules for taking the circumstances and computing the optimal solutions. Sometimes it changes over time. Uh, sometimes there are actions that we have to take, and we don't know exactly what the influences of those actions are. They might be random. They might be poorly understood. And sometimes we might not even be able to fully observe the world. So we might not even know what the circumstances exactly are. For instance, if we're playing poker with somebody, we might have a good idea of what their hand, are, what their hand is, but we, but we might not know exactly. If you have all these problems all together, then you need to model all these uncertainties. Uh, and you sort of need to think of your machine learning system as an agent in a world. Because that's sort of when we think about our learning, that's what we do. We are in the world, we are observing the world, taking actions, continuously updating our mental models, learning all the time while we're taking actions. That's a very complicated situation. It's very difficult to uh, deal with the problem in that way, uh, which, uh, for, but there are frameworks for this. The most popular ones are uh, online learning and reinforcement learning. These are sort of very related uh, families of models where you model everything, basically. You have a model, you have a learner, you have actions, you have an environment. The environment gives you a reward. <clears throat> so you model all of this as one agent, and it's very complicated. And we will talk about this a little bit in week seven, but most of the time we will massively simplify things. And instead of talking about online learning, we will talk about offline learning. So almost all of the course will focus on this. And in offline learning, the way you simplify things is you separate the learning phase of your machine learning pipeline and the acting phase. So you gather up a load of experience, a load of things, whatever it is, that you want the model to learn, called your data set. You do one learning phase on your data set, which produces a model, and that's it. That's the result of your machine learning. In that model, if it's good, you put it into the real world, you put it into your phone and it can recognize faces, but you don't update it continuously. That's why it's, not, why it's called offline learning, because it's not online, it's not continuously learning. You do one learning phase, you check if your model is good enough, and you put it into production. So that, doesn't, uh, that cuts out a lot of the uh, things we talked about. It's not an agent, it's not operating in the real world, it's not real time but it still fits a lot of machine learning use cases. So for a lot of cases, this still works, and it's much, much simpler than online learning or reinforcement learning. So this is what we're going to talk about most of the time, is offline learning. In the 1950s and 60s, scientists built a few working perceptrons, as these artificial brains were called. He's using it to explore the mysterious problem of how the brain learns. This perceptron is being trained to recognize the difference between males and females. It is something that all of us can do easily, but few of us can explain how. To get a computer to do this would involve working out many complex rules about faces and writing a computer program. But this perceptron was simply given lots and lots of examples, including some with unusual hairstyles. But when it comes to a beetle, the computer looks at facial features and hair outline and takes longer to learn what it's told by Dr. Taylor. Andrew Cruikshank's wig also causes a little heart-searching. 
After training on lots of examples, it's given new faces it has never seen and is able to successfully distinguish male from female. It has learned. While promising, this approach to machine intelligence virtually died out. Um, so that's a sort of illustration of uh, what offline learning looks like if you do it by hand. These days, obviously, we don't show pictures one by one to the computer. But in general, that's the idea. Uh, So there's a lot of stuff we want to do, we might want to use machine learning for. Things like playing chess, driving a car, finding terrorists, recommending a movie. But what you don't want is to spend your entire life building a self-learning chess player and then find out that that's all you've done. Because what you ultimately want to do is discover things that transfer from one domain to another. You want to solve not the problem of playing chess, you want to solve the problem of learning. So if your chess player cannot also learn to drive a car, then you still haven't really learned anything about learning. So what we do in order to work towards generalizable solutions in machine learning is we focus on certain abstract tasks called things like classification, regression, clustering, or density estimation. So the idea in machine learning is that you take your use case, you translate it or part of it to an abstract task, and I'll explain how that works in a bit. And then on the other hand, machine learning model developers, they build algorithms that solve these abstract tasks. There's two flavors of this, supervised and unsupervised. In supervised, learning, we give explicit examples of both the output and the input. They are both the input and the output that we want. So for a particular input, we want to learn to create this output. And in unsupervised, we only give a bunch of inputs. Uh, so in supervised learning, we want to predict the output for a new input. And in unsupervised learning, we just get a bunch of things and we want to find some pattern in a big bucket of things. We'll look at examples uh, for both. The two main flavors of supervised learning are classification and regression, which means we've now covered the basics of what ML is, and we're now going to look at some examples of classification. And regression we'll cover after the break. So finally, let's look in detail at how a classification machine learning algorithm works. Basically, we start with the data set, like I said. You gather up some examples of the thing that you want your machine learning model to learn. And the data set is usually best visualized as a kind of a table, consisting of examples of the thing you want to learn. So in this case, for instance, let's say we're doing spam detection on emails, then every example is one email. And the label that we want the machine learning model to learn is whether it's ham or spam. So spam is an unwanted email, ham is a, a wanted email. So all the rows in this table represent emails. Uh, so those are the examples of the things we want to learn. We call those instances. Each of them has a label, which is the thing we want the machine learning model to learn. And then for every instance, we measure certain things. So if you're measuring people, you can measure do body measurement. Uh, if you're measuring things about email, you might, for instance, count for particular words how often they occur. So something like meeting might occur very often in a uh, ham email, and something like congratulations might occur very more often in spam email. So if we take two words, congratulations and meeting, count their frequencies, then we have a data set with two features and one label. Usually features are numbers, but they can also be categories. But we'll stick with numbers for most of the, most of the examples. So now we have a data set with two features and one label. We pass that through a learner. We don't specify what the learner is or how it works. This is our interface. We just say, learner should accept this kind of data set, and it should spit out a model. In this case, called a classifier, because we're doing classification. 
And the model is a program that takes a new input, which we haven't seen, which uh, was not part of the data set. So we know the features, but we don't know the label, and the model provides us with the label. In this case, it thinks that this is spam, and it can be right or wrong. Obviously, the job of the learner is to make sure that the final model output uh, does well, gives the correct answer uh, as often as possible. So let's look at some examples of classification, how to take a use case, a machine learning use case, and translate it into a classification problem. Let's say, for instance, if you uh, are the uh, mail service and you want to learn how to read digits, like uh, zip codes, then you need to, then this is basically your problem. You need to take an envelope and you need to figure out where the zip code is. Then you need to cut the zip code into five uh, digits if you're in America. And then you need to recognize each digit individually. So what we're going to do is we're not going to solve the whole thing by machine learning. We're going to solve one part of the puzzle by machine learning. We're going to assume that we have the digits uh, recognized and cut out. And for one picture of a particular digit, we're going to ask, can we predict what the digit is? So we need a data set. We need a big bag of example digits. Well, there is one called MNIST. These are a lot of the twos in the MNIST data set. And there are uh, equally many examples for all the other uh, nine digits. So if we use that data set and we translate it into a classification problem, it might look something like this. So these are the examples, a bunch of digits. And for each one, well, we have a label, of course, which is which digit it is. So we have 10 different labels from 0 to 9. And the features in this case, we make things easy for ourselves. We say, well, we have 28. There are small pictures. We have 28 by 28 pixels, grayscale pixels, so values between 0 and 1. So every pixel is just a feature. So every possible pixel in the image is one column in our data set. And we're just going to build a data set with lots and lots of features and find a, a machine learning model that can handle that. We pass it to a learner. Learner outputs a classifier. Classifier sees a new digit, new picture. We flatten it out into a row of numbers, 784 numbers. And the classifier predicts what it sees. And we haven't solved the whole problem of looking at an envelope and recognizing the uh, zip code, but we've solved part of it. So now all we need to do is solve all the other parts. Another example, playing chess. So again, we don't want to take the whole problem of playing chess and turn it into a machine learning problem. We want to work it down into a classification problem solve the classification problem, and then make that somehow help us play chess. So here's one way to do that. We get a big database of chess positions, and we label every position at every point in the game with who eventually ended up winning that game. So here's one chess position, and at the end of this game from which we took this position, white won. Uh, it's unclear what exactly the feature should be here. That's a bit more difficult. You can do sort of material counts, like how many knights does uh, white have left, how many knights does black have left. Uh, you can look for more domain knowledge, like things, is there a past pawn, are there, is there a rook on an open file? These are sort of chess experts know that these things are uh, helpful to classify how good a position is. You can add all those as features. Let's just assume that we have a bunch of features. Feed it to a learner, get a classifier, classifier predicts who is most likely to win. That by itself is not a chess player, a chess player, but it can help you build a chess player. For instance, if you find yourself in a particular position and you have a couple of actions, you can search for the action which, according to the classifier, is most likely to result in a win for your color. And if you're familiar with things like Minimax, you can sort of do a bit of tree search first and then once you're out of memory, use the classifier to evaluate your position. Final example, self-driving car. Uh, this is an actual system from 1995 called Alvin. 
where they did something very similar to the MNIST example I showed you earlier. They recorded the road with a uh, camera, a pretty low resolution camera because this is 1995. So we have a camera image of 30 by 32 pixels, which gives us 960 features. Again, one, it's a grayscale image, every pixel is one feature. And then we just label every frame that we record with the action the driver took at that point in time. Specifically, how they turned the steering wheel. Whether they turned it to the left, to the right, or didn't turn it at all. So that's the data set which you can feed to a learner, you give you a classifier, and that classifier you can then use to drive. You can make it classify based on the picture from the camera what it should do. Uh, in the actual system they had more labels, so they had I think 32 different gradations of how far to turn the wheel one, one way or the other. But using that they actually managed to build a self-driving car. So this is enough for a car to drive coast to coast in America. Uh, which is there's still a, you can tell there's still a human in the loop who is executing the uh, commands of the classifier. But basically, they said at least that the human didn't do anything but what the classifier told it to do. Yes. Uh, yes, so th the only thing, uh, the question is, is, is that the only thing that Alvin does, checking whether you go left, right, or straight? So what Alvin does, basically they, um, they built the data set first by driving, and measuring what the steering wheel was doing. Built that into a data set. They learned from that data set, so they mapped pictures like this, like you see here at the bottom of the road, to steering wheel positions. And when the model was trained, they used those predictions to actually drive. And that's enough. Uh, but like I say, it's not just left, right, it's little, much of, a bunch of little steps in between as well. Ah, it's a good question. Does this also work with acceleration and braking? I think they just did the steering wheel. So I think it's uh, constant speed. So there's no parking or dealing with other traffic. It's mostly road following. But remember, it's 1995. So, Alright. So that's how to take a problem and reduce it to a classification problem. The next step is, once you have this classification problem, you have your data set, what does this learner actually do? Uh, well, we're running a little late, so I s recommend we, or uh, I say let's have a break now. So have a break of 15 minutes, and then after we get back, I'll try and answer that question. Uh, before we start, one thing that I didn't mention uh, administratively, if you took the course already before and you passed either the exam or the uh, project, but not the other, and you did it last year or the year before, you can reuse your grade. Uh, to do so, please go to the syllabus page. There is a link to a Google form where you can fill in your details. Uh, and if it's 2018 or 2019, you can reuse the grade that way. Uh, all right. So we had a... Uh, in-depth look at uh, classification before the break, how to take a, a, a machine learning type use case and how to cut it up into a, a manageable size and work it into a classification project so that uh, problem so that we can apply an, a classification algorithm. So now let's have a look at what a classification algorithm looks like. So we'll use this data set as a running example. I'll take a bunch of people, in this case uh, soldiers from the US, and we measure two things about them. So we have two features. The uh, stature, which is a fancy name for the height, and the intersi, which is a fancy name for the distance between the shoulder blades. We measure these two things, and based on that we predict whether they are male or female. So because we only have two features, we can easily plot our data set. We put the height stat or stature on one axis, and the oh, intersi on the other. Uh, and then every point in our data set, every person, becomes a dot. And we've colored the men blue and the women red. 
So how do we build a classifier on top of this? How do we predict when we see a new point whether they're male or female? Well, let's start with a very simple idea. We draw a line. We just draw a line. We can do it visually now because we have only two features where we broadly think uh, the best line that separates these two classes. That's called a linear classifier. Then when we see a new point, a new person, we measure, again, their features. We measure their stature and their intersi. We find them in our axis. And then we see, are they above the line or below the line? If they're above the line, we call them blue. We call them male. We predict that they're male. If they're below the line, we predict that they're female. And you can see that we're not always right, obviously. So these people we would get wrong, even though we've seen them during the training. Uh, but for most of the people we've seen, this is a good, uh, a good line to draw. One thing to mention here is that, obviously, like I say, we can visualize it because we have only two features. But when we design classifiers, when we design classification algorithms, they should work with an arbitrary number of features. So if you have just one feature, it would look like a line, and the separating linear structure would be a point. If you have two features, it becomes a plane, and the linear separator becomes a line. If we have three features, we get a cube, or a, a three space, and the separating linear structure would be a plane. And in 4D, it would be difficult to visualize, but Basically, we would have a 3D structure called a hyperplane. For anything higher than 3, it's just a hyperplane, which separates these things. So it's difficult to visualize, it's difficult to think about, but practically the math is pretty straightforward. So we're going to have a look at that next uh, Thursday, uh, coming Thursday, sorry, to uh, see how that math works out. But for now, you can sort of trust that this is pretty easy to do. So then the question is, which line? We have a data set, which line do we draw to separate these two classes? Here are two lines, the one we drew earlier, the green one, and a very bad choice, the orange one. And every line you can draw in this space, uh, you can determine by three numbers. You can also do it by two numbers, but three is a little easier. So we pick three numbers, A, B, and C, and we arrange them like this together with the features. And we set that equal to zero, and that this equation, all the points for which this thing equals zero, determines a line. So basically, by choosing these three numbers, we have chosen a line. So three numbers, we can also make a space out of that, a space out of A, B, and C. And every point in this space, here we have an orange point, for instance, is a line in this space. So this orange point represents this orange line. We call this, on the left, the feature space. It's the space where the data lives. And on the right, we call the model space. It's the space where the models live. And every point in the model space becomes a boundary separating the two classes in the feature space. In this case, a line. But for other models, it might have a different shape. Final ingredient we need in order to do our training is what's called a loss function. And the loss function tells us for a particular model, how good is it? So the loss function is a function not from the data to the output, like the classifier, but from a model to a performance metric. A simple loss function might be how many examples in the training data do I misclassify? And the green line here misclassifies a few examples, and the orange line misclass misclassifies lots of examples. So the orange line has a higher loss in this case. So depending on our... Uh, classification and on our situation we have to choose a loss function we go into lots of different ways of defining a loss function throughout the course but basically the loss function is the thing that you want to get lower the lower the better so we can take our model space and we can color it by the loss so the brighter the models uh, the brighter we color it the better the models in the in that part of the model space so these are the models with very high, uh, very low loss, and these are the models with very high loss. So the whole thing about searching for a good model, training, basically le machine learning, is setting up your model space and looking for the bright points in the model space, looking for the points that have low loss. That's all we're doing. That's the whole business of machine learning. The only drawback, well, there are two drawbacks, but, but the main drawback is that we cannot see 
our data like this, obviously now we can go well. It's over there. But in most cases, this is five dimensional or 700 dimensional, so it's a little bit more difficult. Um, we'll look at how, this exa how exactly this works in the next lecture. Uh, but now just to give you a, a very different way of doing it, just to give you sort of idea of how many different ways there are of doing it. Uh, this is a decision tree classifier. And instead of saying I'm drawing a line in space, the model looks like a tree. We start at the root, and the root picks a feature and says, look at that feature, see if it's higher or lower than this value, and go left or right. If it's higher than the value, we go right, and then we get another feature. And if it's higher or lower than 42.4, we go left or right. We do that a couple of times, and then we reach the leaves of the tree here at the bottom. And the leaves of the tree are labeled with a prediction. So this is our model. Might be a good model, might be a bad model, but this is a little machine to build a prediction for an unseen uh, person. So if you look in the feature space how this looks, you get this decision boundary. So what you see is that it's uh, locally the axes are always axis aligned because locally we're always looking at one axis, one feature, if it's higher or lower. And we get this kind of step function. That's what a decision tree looks like. This is one I came up with just uh, by looking at the data. If you actually train one, you get many more nodes. And it looks more like this. I want to explain exactly how the training algorithm works. We'll look at that in week five. But this is the decision boundary you might get if you train a big decision tree. Last example, k-nearest neighbors. K-nearest neighbors, unlike decision trees or linear learners, uh, it doesn't do any learning. It just remembers the data set. And then when it gets a new um, example, like the circle with the question mark here, it just looks at the training examples that are most similar to it. Or more specifically, the training examples that are next to it in the feature space. So in this case, we set k to 7. So it picks the seven nearest examples in the feature space, which are the ones that it has little lines drawn to. And we see that five of them are male and two of them are female. So we predict that this person is male. Here's what that looks like if we zoom out. Here's our unknown person. And here you can see what the decision boundary looks like. Sort of slightly jaggy, a little bit linear, but not quite linear. And the more data you have, the more jagged it gets. So this is a very, very effective classifier. And it's very simple because you don't even have to do any training. You just remember the data set. That's called K nearest neighbor. Yeah, Matt. Uh, so the question is, is it weighted or is it absolute? Depends on what version you use. There's absolute versions, there's weighted versions, but absolute works perfectly fine. But you can also say the ones that are further away are weighted less, count less heavily. You can do that, and sometimes it helps. So that's three ways of doing classification. A couple of uh, exceptions we did, didn't talk about. So. Um, we only saw numeric features in this example, but there are also categorical features like um, hair color, eye color, that sort of thing, uh, where it's not a number, it's just one of a, a finite set of possibilities. But that's usually the two things you get, categories or numbers. If you have something else, like a phone number or a date, you have to translate it to either a number or a category. We'll look in the second week at how to do that. The nicest situation is binary classification when you have two classes. But sometimes you have more, like the digit example, then there's 10 classes. It's called multi-class classification. There's also multi-label classification, which is a very different beast. In multi-class classification, like in the digit example, one of the classes is true. In multi-label classification, none, some, or all of the classes might be true. We won't talk about this much or at all in this course. But this is a very different sort of uh, thing, and it's, it's usually a bit more difficult. Uh, and finally, sometimes you don't just want a class, you don't just want the classifier to just give you a class, but you want a kind of a little bit of fuzziness. So there's, a lots, of, there's lots of ways to ask your classifier 
to give you either a probability distribution over the classes or to score the classes. So you can see, well, this is the most likely class, this is the second most likely class. And sometimes that's very helpful. And for most classifiers, there's a good way to do this. We'll talk about that as well in the next week. So this is a recap, because this is where the break was supposed to happen. So we talked about online, offline learning. Abstract tasks, how to take a machine learning model and a uh, machine learning use case and uh, abstract it into something that you can apply a pre-built uh, pre model to. Look for classification, classification algorithms, and various ML concepts like feature space, model space, and loss function. So that's classification. Uh, let's look at regression now. This is a break. Um, so in classification, we have inputs and outputs, and the outputs are a categorical uh, attribute. Regression is exactly the same, except the output is a number. That's all it is. We have a data set, a bunch of features for every example, same as the classification, except the target column now is not a category, but a number. Again, we pass it to a learner. The learner produces a model. There's no fancy name for the model in this case. With classification, we had a classifier. With regression, we just have a model. I don't know why. And we feed the model a new unseen data item, and we want it to produce a number. So another example, same data set. In this case, we're going to have just one feature, which, because it, this makes it easier to uh, visualize it. So we just, the feature is just the uh, height, the stature. And in this case, we have a different target column, which is the height of the leg, which is usually halfway, about halfway up the, bo up, up the body, but there's a bit of variance. So it's, it's relatively easy to predict from the height, but it's not perfectly predictable. So it's a data set with one feature and one target column. Now we can plot this, and it's, same thing we saw earlier, it's a scatter plot with a bunch of uh, dots, and each dots, dot represents an example in our data set. One thing to remember is that in this case we have a 1D feature space, so we're not looking at the feature space. The whole picture here is not the feature space. The bottom axis is our feature space. We have a one-dimensional feature space, but for every element in our feature space, we have an output label. So the task is to map this space to this space, based on these examples. So we can do the same three things, same three examples. Do regression using a linear model, do regression using a tree model, and do regression using a k nearest neighbor model. So I'll start with the linear model. We draw a line. I didn't draw the line very accurately, but basically the line is the model, so we, uh, if we see a person of this height, we see what the line predicts, and we get an output. We take that as our prediction. Uh, so we can look a little bit more at the loss function now. How would we define a loss for this model? Because it's not a very good model. So we want to uh, determine how good it is and if we can do better. Uh, so we'll have a look at our first proper loss function, which is called the mean squared error loss. So the loss for a particular model, this line, defined by some numbers. So P is a bunch of numbers. Uh, we'll look next week at how exactly to define this line by those numbers. For now, we'll just say f is the function that uh, the function described by this line. For this um, particular model, we loop over the data, we sum over the data, we sum this value, this blue value here. And the value is what we call the residual. And the residual is just the difference between what the model predicts and what the data tells us. So those are those blue, uh, blue sticks. We square all the residuals, and then we sum them up. So you might ask, why do we square the residuals? Why not just sum them up as they are? There's two good reasons for this. Any thoughts? You don't want negative values. Uh, well, sort of, to be slightly more precise, if you sum this up, then this one will cancel, if you sum them up without squaring, then this one will cancel out against this one. So you have two big errors, 
but because one is positive and one is negative, this, their sum is still zero. So it's actually a bad model, but it gets zero loss, so you don't want that. Anything, any other reason? Correct. So the answer is the uh, the square actually disproportionately penalizes big residuals. So the bigger your residual gets, the bigger your loss, obviously, but the loss gets bigger as a square of the size of the residual. So it's not just a linear, but it's it's uh, so it, it's sort of the mean squared error lo loss looks disproportionately at big errors, which is sometimes something you want, sometimes something you don't want. That's a choice. But that's what you get with MSE loss. And we'll look at different loss functions later. So now the question is, uh, which line will give me the lowest MSE loss? That's this line. Again, next lecture we'll see how to find this line. But if we do find it, it looks like this, which is roughly what you would expect. So that's a linear regression model. We can also do a regression tree which basically draws a tree over the feature space, splits it at one point, says go left, go right, where you encounter another node, splits it, says go left, go right, a bunch of times, until we get to the leaves, where it basically usually it has one or two training data, uh, one or two training points that, that fit that part, fall in that part of the tree, and there it takes the value of that training point or the average of the points that, that fall in the leaf, and the resulting predictions for the entire feature space look like this. So very jaggy line. This. Why does the regression tree ignore some dots? Uh, ah, so the question is, why does the regression tree ignore some dots? Uh, it's a good question. So this is probably a case here or here where it's decided to put a couple of um, dots together in one leaf, in one leaf of the node, uh, of the tree. And then it just takes the average. It's also possible that these are people with the same height. In fact, thinking about it, these are probably where we see the, the dots that it doesn't hit exactly. There are probably people with exactly the same height. So either it picks one of them exactly, or it takes their average. But it, in that case, it cannot hit all of them, because it, for every input, it can only produce one output. It has to be a, a deterministic function. Uh, and finally, the k-nearest neighbor regression, which looks a bit like this. So this is sort of, if you take the average for a particular point, you take the average of the nearest seven points, this is the function you get. So it's sort of in between the, the linear and the um, tree version. Uh, so now, probably the most important point I want to make in this lecture, and actually the most important point I want to make in the whole course, so it's good uh, you all showed up for this lecture because this is the most important part. The most important thing I'm going to tell you. If you look at a model like this, the tree model specifically, you can see that they hit almost all the points in the training set exactly. In fact, I think this one on the left gets all points exactly right. So the question then is, does that make it a good model? It gets the lowest possible loss on the training data. If you look at this, all we're telling it is the height and the distance between the shoulder blades. And it makes a lot of very specific predictions. Let's look at the uh, regression model specifically. So it has this spike here, for instance. So what it's saying, if I see somebody who's 182 centimeters, I predict this height. But if they're 103 centimeters long, then I suddenly, my prediction for the height of their legs suddenly jumps up by 10 centimeters. And then if they're 104 centimeters long, it goes down, bam, by 10 centimeters again. Which is not justified by the data at all, right? It's just randomness. This is just randomness, but the model is drawing out all this randomness and remembering all this randomness. So actually, the loss that you get on your training data, even though you try to minimize it when you train your model, is not a good indicator of how good your model is. That's not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to just get a low loss on the training data. It's a little bit more complicated than that. What we want is a model that gets low loss on new data. 
the data that we haven't seen yet. Uh, so if we look at something like this, if we get some new data, some point that we haven't seen before, uh, this spike is clearly unjustified because it's much more likely to fall here than at the top of that spike. So what we do instead is we withhold some data. We take our training data, we split off some part of it, we call that the test data, we train our model on one set of data, uh, on the training data, and then we test it after we've trained it on the data we've withheld, which we call the test data. And importantly, we don't get to see the test data until we've chosen the model. And the fundamental challenge of machine learning is to build a model that does well on the test data, which we don't get to see during training. So that's why it's difficult. And that sort of brings us back to the uh, problem of induction, why machine learning or why learning in general is such a difficult problem. Because we don't know, when we look at the data, which parts of it are pattern and which parts of it are noise. In this case, we can say that the um, regression tree overfits because it models all this noise explicitly. That's because we happen to know that that's noise. In other situations, that might not be noise. That might actually be pattern. So it depends on the situation, on your use case, which is pattern, which is noise. There's no general applicable rule for this. And that's one of the fundamental problems of machine learning, why induction sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. We still don't really know when it does and when it doesn't. We just sort of trial and error. Sometimes machine learning works, sometimes it doesn't. But again, just to really hammer this point home, good training, good uh, low loss on the training data is not an indication of a good model. Uh, so I think that's all I wanted to say about regression. So let's quickly plow through some unsupervised uh, machine learning. Oh yeah, so um, just to see how simple this is once you get all your code up and running, this is how it looks in, in code. You import some stuff from a library, you define your test and training set somehow, you say, I want this model. You call a fit function, and you show the fit function your data. And then you get uh, an object here called tree, which you can use to predict a new, uh, to predict the target value for a new, uh, a new unseen value. And then you can compute something like accuracy. So just to show all these steps that we talked about are basically one line of code in a machine learning model, and the whole thing put together is like a handful of lines of code. So unsupervised learning tasks, what happens if you have a data set but you don't have a target feature? Basically unsupervised learning, we give our learner some data set and we say, give us any pattern you can come up with. We don't know what we want out of it, just tell us what you see. So one uh, example is clustering, where we basically do classification, except we don't have a target column. So the model outputs a cluster ID. We say cluster this data into five different, uh, five different clusters, however you like, and different clustering algorithms use different principles. And it's much more difficult to evaluate when something works well, but sometimes it's, it's useful to have this kind of uh, pattern finding in your data. Uh, I'll skip this if you're interested. This is just an example of how one clustering algorithm works. Uh, if you're interested, uh, have a look at the slides. There's an explanation in the annotations. Um, density estimation is a little bit like unsupervised regression in that your model outputs a number, but it's not just any number, it's a probability density. So it's basically what we want is this num for this number to be high for instances of your data that are likely, even though you might not have seen them. So a very common way of doing density estimation is fitting a probability distri distribution to data. These are the grades of the 2017 uh, edition of this course. And if you've done a little bit of statistics, you'll know that you can fit a normal distribution to this, which would put the mean about here. Uh, and that basically gives you density estimation. It gives you a probability density over your whole feature space. Of course, it's not exactly a 
normal probability distribution because it has two, three different peaks, different modes as we call them. So it's probably better to fit three separate normal distributions to this and sum them up, which you can do, but it's much more difficult. Uh, that's one of the uh, density estimation methods that we're going to talk about somewhere in week five, I think. Finally, sometimes it's very difficult to fit a density um, the probability model to your feature space because it's um, you have to make sure it sums to one if you integrate. And it's much more easy in some cases to uh, fit a model that doesn't give you a probability density but lets you sample from, the, from a probability distribution that fits the data. So we look at some data, we fit a distribution to it that doesn't give us probability density, that's too difficult, but we can say to the model, give me a new data point that is like the data we showed you earlier. And you can do this much easier with, with sort of high dimensional data. For instance, images. So these two people, you may have seen them before, uh, don't exist. This is a, a model called the StyleGAN, which was shown 70,000 pictures of people, I think, or 60,000, so not that many. Uh, of high resolution, high resolution for machine learning, so 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. It learned for a long time, and then we got a model that could spit out these faces. And this is not uh, curated, so these are basically the first two faces the author saw when they uh, generated faces with this model. And I think you'll agree this is pretty, uh, pretty convincing. So this is an example of deep learning, uh, which is a, a popular method of uh, machine learning, which we'll talk about starting in week, uh, also week five, I think. So those are ways of doing unsupervised machine learning. Uh, so finally, it might be helpful to talk a little bit about how machine learning compares to other fields, other fields that aren't machine learning but are related to it are broader or narrower. So let's talk about AI first. AI and machine learning are often conflated in the, especially in the media. All machine learning I would say is AI, but not all AI is machine learning. So there's a couple of examples of things that are AI but not machine learning. Things like planning, automated reasoning, and I used to have in this slide playing chess, which was uh, way back when, in 2001 or thereabouts, uh, when the first professional chess, the first chess grandmaster, or in fact a chess champion, was beaten by a computer program, Deep uh, Blue, am I fingers right? Yes. Um, back then, that was a big AI triumph, obviously. We first created a computer that can beat a human at chess, the best human in the world at chess. And those were not machine learning models. They didn't learn in any way. Those were just chess playing programs and all they did was basic tree search with a very good uh, heuristic. The reason I've crossed it out is that these days the best chess player in the world is a program by DeepMind which does use uh, machine learning. So nowadays chess playing is mostly the domain of machine learning. Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, well, then thank you for correcting me. So it's 96 or 7, apparently. I, I don't know the exact date, but yes, uh, Kasparov lost to a system uh, from IBM called Deep Blue. So that was not a learning system, but these days, the best chess players we have are learning systems. And they learn to play chess by playing against versions of themselves. Nevertheless, there are lots of ways of doing AI that are, have nothing to do with learning. Then there's data science and machine learning, which is again similar situation. Not all data science is machine learning, but all machine learning is to some extent data science. So there is a lot of stuff you do when you're a data scientist, uh, working with data, gathering data, cleaning up data, that sort of precedes the part when you start applying models to your data. Uh, so usually 80% of a data science project is working with your data, cleaning up your data, and then 20% of it is just picking the right machine learning model or statistics model that sort of uh, 
uh, nebulous uh, difference. So that's how, how data science and machine learning relate. Uh, data mining and machine learning are also two much more related concepts. It's much more difficult to pin down when something's data mining but not machine learning. So I've come up with the following, which are sort of both, but more one thing than the other. So more data mining than machine learning would be performing analytics on click streams or finding fraud in transaction networks or looking at a big bag of data and looking for patterns. That's in some sense unsupervised machine learning, but mostly it's just looking for things that are out of the ordinary. So it's a little bit more data mining than machine learning. And something like spam classification or sp predicting stock prices or learning robot control. In some sense, you are learning from data. So there is a big data set and you're mining it, but it's not really taking an existing database of big data and mining it for interesting patterns. You're really looking to create a software module that you can reuse in a robot or in a, uh, an email client rather than actually studying the data for the data's sake, which is more what you do in data mining. But as you see in the picture, they are different but very related fields. Uh, it's a different story for information retrieval and ML. So information retrieval is building search engines. You might say, well, those are different subjects. But actually, a lot uh, there is more overlap than you might initially think in that coming up with a good answer to a query is kind of a classification problem. It's a bit like recommending a movie. You want to, you have a query, you want to match a document to that, and that's a, kind of, uh, that's a very good machine learning problem in that you don't have to get it exactly right. You're perfectly justified in just returning 20 search results and saying to the user, do any of these um, work for you? Um, so you can actually model that as a classification problem, and that can give you some insights. And in the back end of a lot of these search engines, there are a lot of machine learning modules that sort of uh, detect patterns or highlight relevance. So there is overlap here, uh, even though the aims of the two fields are very different. Statistics and machine learning is also a tricky one to explain the difference. Uh, so something that would be statistics but not machine learning is analyzing the results of a research uh, of research, uh, maybe you know, testing a drug versus a placebo on mice, um, designing an experiment or working out courtroom evidence. It's not really about building software. It's about figuring out the truth. Uh, does the drug work or does the drug not work? And I think that's the main reason, be main difference between statistics and machine learning is machine learning isn't really interested in finding out the truth. It's interesting finding something that works like a movie recommender, it doesn't have to be true, it just has to work well enough to be useful. Whereas statistics is really dealing with the business of figuring out the truth, which might re um, require specific data to be gathered. So you actually need experiment design uh, and a, a kind of loop of experimentation and statistics in order to figure out what the truth is, which machine learning is less de uh, deals with less. Nevertheless, once you get down to the stuff you actually do with your data, statistics and machine learning are basically the same thing. They're just the same methods used for different purposes. Finally, deep learning. I mentioned it earlier, uh, but before today, who had heard of deep learning before? Yeah, it's just three years ago, it was about 50% of the room. Now it's pretty much 100%. Um, basically, deep learning is a particular flavor of machine learning, but a particularly effective one and a particularly popular one. So we'll start out, we'll start in week four, uh, looking at what deep learning is and how that works. So that's all. Here's a little summary of the field of machine learning we talked about, uh, specifically the different sort of ways of, of uh, looking at machine learning. A little flow chart, so here's the, uh, the reinforcement learning, the online learning, which we're not going to talk about. And once you get down to this area, Example, input and output, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, that's the stuff we're going to talk about. This is the basic recipe we descri described. 
abstract your uh, problem to a standard task, choose your instances and your features, choose your model class and your loss function, and search for a good model. That's the basic recipe of machine learning, which we'll be building on throughout the course. And we'll be filling in different parts of this recipe as the course progresses. We'll discuss how to search, how to dis uh, design models, stuff like that. More summary, you can look at it when you uh, have some time. These are all the lectures, so this is basically what we'll be doing over the next eight weeks. And here again is what you can do today. And that's all. Uh, and thank you for your attention. I'll see you on Thursday morning.